Good evening. We're going to be studying through Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. And we'll get a Bible to you. I do have one, one other really quick announcement. Uh, for the first three Saturdays of, um, of November, we're going to be meeting outside at 9.30 in the morning from 9.30 to about 12 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be going downtown and passing out flyers to the homeless. A few, uh, me and a couple guys, we didn't really announce it, just me and a couple guys went out uh, this last week, uh, Saturday morning, and um, it was really good. Had some great opportunities to, to speak to some people. And um, so, you know, I got stories, maybe I'll share them later, but uh, if you want to see your own stories, you can come with us. So again, 9.30 on Saturday, the first three Saturdays of November. We're going to be meeting right out here outside the chapel, and then we'll, we'll head out downtown. So let me, uh, I'll read this, and then I'll pray. So you can follow along with me. Again, Colossians chapter 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death the members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcision, or nor uncircumcised, excuse me, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Father, we thank you for this particular Wednesday, God, that by your sovereign hand you'd have us in this very place or, or watching online. And so, Father, we believe that you want to speak to our hearts Tonight, Lord, as you do every time the word is preached or we open up our Bibles, and so, God, we ask that you would do it again. God, that we would live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And, God, we pray tonight would be no exception, Lord, that you would uh, cleanse us, God, by the washing of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first verse where it says, If then, Paul is making an assumption and the assumption is that if you were raised with Christ, like, like if you really were raised with Christ, then there's an, an assumption or an expectation. And, it, and in this case, the expectation is that we would seek those things which are above. But he really kind of is following his thought as we kind of are picking up on last week because he kind of makes the same statement, something similar uh, about the death of Christ in verse 20. So, so just jump with me back up to chapter 2, verse 20. And he says this, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though living in the world do you subject yourself to regulations? So he's making two if statements, and both if statements have an assumption or an expectation followed alongside with this if statement. The first of all is that if you died with Christ, then why do you live according to the regulations of this world? And we'll, I kind of recap on that from last week if you weren't with us. And then he says, but concerning the death of Christ, you should no longer be under bondage to, to regulations. But now concerning the resurrection of Christ, if you died when Christ died and you were raised when Christ was raised, then seek those things which are above. So one is a reference to uh, the freedom that we have been delivered from because we were once in bondage. So he's making a reference to Jews that have 
uh, gotten saved, and now they're coming into the church. Maybe they themselves have been converted, or they're coming in as those that are trying to um, bring dissension and confusion to the Christians who have uh, been born again are, and are experiencing the liberty of Christ. So let me give you maybe just a few examples, uh, both then and maybe modern day today. Uh, one of those would be uh, that it was required of the Jews that they should wear a very specific kind of clothing that was given to them by God. And, and they were to do this uh, because what they wore symbolized their relationship and their covenant with God. And so, and so it was evident not only to those around them, but it was evident to themselves that they served the true and living God. While these other nations all around them uh, served and worshipped different gods. And so uh, they wore clothing according to the gods that they worshipped. In fact, you might even say that some wore no clothing. They were into sexual immorality. And so, so God had a way of setting apart his people by uh, defining what they would wear. And this was a way of saying, hey, listen, you belong to me and you're not like the nations around you, right? But that's changed in Christ because all of that was really a shadow of what God would do in Christ. Because in Christ, as we talked about last week, God is no longer fashioning or determining what we're to look like on the outside because now God has done the ultimate work by setting us apart, not by what we wear, but by what dwells within us. He fills us with the Holy Spirit. So really, their apparel was a foreshadow of what God would do on the inside. Essentially, he'd say, hey, listen, uh, here's how you're going to show the world that you belong to me. I want you to change what you look like. But I'm going to do the greater work to come, not only of changing what you look like on the outside, but of changing who you are in the inside. So for a season, if you will, I want you to operate under these commands because really they're an illustration of what I'm going to fulfill in the Spirit. Some Christians today would, would apply some of those same principles to Christians. They would take laws that were specifically given to the Jews and they might tell a, an ignorant Christian, you can be a Christian and be ignorant. I mean, we're, we're all growing. Can I get an amen? amen. And, and, and some people take advantage of ignorant Christians. And so they might say something like this. You know, they might say, you know, in the book of uh, Leviticus, there's a law given to God's people that you shall not get tattoos, right? It says, do not mark yourself uh, for the dead and do not mark your body. Right? And so they might go to a, a weak Christian, somebody who doesn't understand their Bible, and they might say, well, why do you Christians pick and choose what you want to believe out of the Bible? And they would take them to the, to, uh, to, to the verse in Leviticus where it's, it explicitly says that we shall not mark ourselves for the dead or uh, get tattoos. Now, the problem with that is if you keep reading along in that verse... The very next sentence, it's a sentence before or after, I would have, uh, I would have brought the verse, but uh, I, I didn't think about bringing it up until right now, so I'm just saying it off memory at this point. <laughs> but if you, if you read the verse before or after, it says, and, and, and do not shave the side of your beard. Right? So the person who's telling you not to pick and choose, guess what, guess what they just did this morning? If, assuming it's a man. <laughs> or... <laughs> Or a hairy woman. <laughs> As they're telling you not to pick and choose, guess what they just did? They just picked and choose what verse that they wanted to use to bring you under guilt, to bring you under condemnation, to bring you back under the law and the demands of the law and make you try to fulfill what they themselves are not fulfilling. This was a specific law given to a specific people the people of Israel, the Jewish, the Jewish nation, and God had given it to them so that they could be separate from the rest of the world. But now the scripture says that there is no Greek or Jew in Christ because all are one. Well, what does that mean? That means nobody is no longer separated by what they wear or what they don't wear. 
God, God is doing a new thing. In fact, that's what it says in Isaiah 43. Behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I, I make a way in the wilderness and streams of water in the desert. In fact, in that verse, he goes, forget the former things of the past. In other words, what he's saying is the way that I revealed myself to my people in times past, I'm going to reveal myself to, to, um, to my people, my, my call people who I call by my name in a new way. In fact, uh, it is, it's so good the way that I'm going to reveal myself to them that it's not even worthy of comparing to the way that I revealed myself to them in the past. I'm doing a new thing. And so they were separated on the outward. They literally circumcised their flesh, the foreskin of an eight-day-old male. And all of that was symbolism, the way that God would one day circumcise the heart and cut away the sin and cut away the flesh from the heart. That no longer were they separated by what they wore, but now by what they believe what they're clothed in spiritually, which is Christ. And so some of this still seeps into the church today. I remember one day I, I walked into church and I had on this, uh, this, this skeleton. It was like, it just showed ribs, you know, of like, um, I don't know, it was like a cool shirt. I liked it. <laughs> and, and I was invited to, to rap at this church. And so I went and the pastor's like, he, I just saw him grill me up and down. He was like, that's a skeleton on your shirt. <laughs> oh, oh my, you're right. <laughs> he was like, you know that represents death. And I, and I was like, I, th this really happened. I really said this. It, in, the, in, the, in the ribs, it had a heart. It was a bleeding heart, but nevertheless, it was a heart. <laughs> And I was like, well, actually, actually, it's, it's got a heart, so it's alive, right? Like, <laughs> the problem is he, he was associating what I wore with holiness. He thought that if I wore the proper attire, I would be holy. But he doesn't know what's going on in my heart. He doesn't know that I could have come to his church wearing a suit and tie and been filled with all kinds of sin. Right? On, on the flip side, I was wearing a shirt that to him represented death, but, but God is more concerned about what he's doing in my heart. What he, what he should have been asking me is, what does my life look like, not what does my shirt look like? Come on, somebody. We are now no longer brought under bondage to the law. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean when I say bondage here in just a moment. But, but even the perception of what people, you know, people think that we're, that, that there are greater powers than, than God. Kind of like we talked about last week and, and, and Pastor Tony just kind of referenced to, you know, some people would say, oh, I can't believe you're doing something on, on Halloween as if somehow the day has power over God's people when we know that the scripture says the fullness of the earth and the fullness thereof belongs to him, that all belongs to him. I, I, I heard a story once of a missionary pastor. I believe it's a true story, and if not, it should be. It's a great story. <laughs> I'll just tell it to you like it's true, but um, I heard a story of a missionary pastor who was, he was hungry, and so he told his family, listen, I, I believe that God is going to provide. God's, God's going to provide. He told his his, uh, but they, they had ran out of the last item in the cabinet, and so they had nothing. And, and, he, and he kept telling his family, listen, God is going to provide. He's going to provide. Then he tells his, his son, listen, I want you to set the table. I want you to get the table ready for tonight. God, God's going to provide. So they had no food in the cabinet. They had eaten the very last drop of whatever they had. And here's the son. He's setting the table as if somehow food is just going to, show up. So of course, you know, the kids think dad is crazy, uh, or maybe, maybe they, 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 they've seen God provide many times before. I, you know, I don't know what's going on in their mind, but they set the table and they go out that night. They have some things to take care of. And now there was a lot of witchcraft in the village that they were um, missionaries in. And so 
uh, it was common for people to, to, to try to put hexes and curses and, and things like that. So they come home that night, and sure enough, there's a, there is a, um, a slaughtered, bloody chicken just right there on, in the doorstep. And, and written in blood is like this curse over the door. And the father walks over to the chicken, picks it up, and begins to pray, Father, we thank you that you have provided. <laughs> we asked you to provide. We believe that you were going to provide. God, we thank you for this chicken that we're about to receive. And then he went inside. He cooked it. And they had dinner that night. Come on, somebody. He knew that the scripture says, greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. There is, no, there is no curse that the devil can put on you as a believer. Listen, I'm not saying curses are not real. I'm saying that if you serve a God, you serve a God who is greater than any demon in hell and Satan himself. The Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevent, uh, prevail against it, against what God is doing in your life against the work of God, the new thing. The, the irony is that though we're freed from rules and regulations, uh, and, and I think it's important to specify, what are we free to? Well, we're free to enjoy God. The irony is that the world spends all of its time trying to be free from God. And in turn, they become slaves. They're looking for freedom. They run from God because they want to be free from God's what they would call control. But in trying to become free, they become slaves. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Because you were once a slave. And the irony is that you were a slave because you were pursuing freedom. And that was the very thing that made you a slave. Because you thought, and I thought, that we could get it from any other place than God. Did you know that this is the only reason that people reject God? In fact, Matthew 7 tells us that this is the reason that people don't understand the gospel. The Bible says that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. So they hear the gospel, and the reason that they reject the gospel is because to them it's foolishness. And I would ask, well, why is it foolishness? If you would, turn with me real quickly to Luke chapter 19. At the core of rejecting the gospel, rejecting the gospel is not an intellectual problem. It's a problem of the will. Jesus illustrates this for us in Luke chapter 19 as he tells a parable beginning at verse 11. He says, Now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem. By the way, that's, that's key to understanding the context. Now, as they, as, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So here's the Jews. They know the prophecies that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And they're expecting the coming of Christ, the Messiah. That's what Christ means. The, that they're, they're expecting that he's going to fulfill this prophecy of, of, of ruling and reigning in Jerusalem, throwing off 
uh, the restraints of the Roman government and everything else that was holding the Jews in bondage, that Christ was going to come, the Messiah was going to come, he was going to liberate them, and he was going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. He was going to establish peace on the earth. So Jesus is saying, because he knows that they have this in mind, and because he's approaching Jerusalem, he tells them a parable. And this parable, I'm just going to kind of set it up before we read it. This, this parable, he's explaining there's two comings. And they're ignorant of the scriptures, and so that's why they think that Christ is going to establish this prophecy in his first coming. But he's going to explain to them, no, 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 no. Read the prophecy again. There's two comings. Does it not say that the Messiah should suffer? Does it not say that, that his bones would be pulled out of place? Does it not say that he would be led to the slaughter like a sheep is silent before its shearers? That so he would be silent before those that crucify him? So the first time the Messiah must come and die. And then he'll return and he'll establish this prophecy that you're in expectation for. So he's going to tell them this in a parable. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country. That's Christ. He's referring to himself. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. So he's going to receive a kingdom for himself, and then he's going to come back to the kingdom. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minas, and said to them, do business till I come. So this is a parable about Christ coming, him dying, and in his death he gives gifts to men, and he leaves the church responsible for doing business until he returns. And he said to them, do business till I come, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, listen to what they say. Why would they reject Christ? Why would they reject the gospel, the free offer of, of hey, God wants to gift you, God wants to use you, and, and all you got to do is just say yes. And then you just be faithful with whatever he does in your life. And when he returns... If you have been faithful with a little, he'll make you ruler over much. That's, that's the gospel. That God is going to entrust you with all of his possessions and, and, then, and then reward you for what he does through you if you'll just say yes. Why, why would somebody reject the gospel? Here's, here's why they rejected it. They hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us. Receiving and rejecting the gospel is not a matter of intellect. It's a matter of the will. Are you with me? The reason that people reject the gospel is because they do not want God to enter into their hearts. I have conversations with people all the time. They, they go a little something like this. They say, do you... Uh, are you a believer? Maybe they begin saying yes. Then I explain to them what a believer is. A believer is somebody who is, a matter of fact, let me just rephrase that. Most of the time they say yes. Even the atheists. I'm not even kidding. I'm not kidding. You get in a conversation with somebody who proclaims to be an atheist long enough, and by the time you start talking about the condemnation that comes from walking in the flesh, they start to say, well, I mean, I was, I, I was, you know, I was born in a Christian household. So basically what they just said is, well, just in case this whole atheism thing doesn't work out, I was raised a Christian, so I'm good. And I was baptized, so it's all good. We're good. They say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Then I explain to them, what, is it, what, what does it mean to be a Christian? And then I usually take them to Ezekiel 
chapter 36, where it talks about God indwelling you with the Holy Spirit, changing your heart. And then I asked them, has there been a moment when your heart has changed from loving sin to loving God? You can actually look back at that moment. Is, is your heart changed? Maybe, maybe, maybe you, you're one of, the, one of the few, I would say, who gave their life to Christ and you can't remember the day, but nevertheless, you know without a shadow of a doubt that your heart has been changed, that you desire God and all that you do. You're free to worship him. This is your greatest desire. A lot of times in those conversations, they respond by saying, you know what? To be honest, I... I don't, I don't think I've ever, that's ever happened to me. I'm not, I mean, I'm not kidding. These conversations really go like this. So most of the time, a lot of the time, I can get somebody to confess that they have never been filled with the Holy Spirit. And they'll admit that. They don't have a problem admitting that. But here's where it gets interesting. So then I, I point it out to them and I say, so you realize that you just confessed to me that you've never been born again. And Jesus said in John chapter three, unless a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. So based off Jesus's words, if you were to die right now, you would spend eternity in hell. Now watch this. They don't, they don't feel condemned. I mean, they don't feel like I'm coming at them. They, they, at this point, uh, most of the time, they recognize I'm just sharing with them truth. I'm just sharing with them what the Bible says. So they're, they're, they're walking with me. So then I ask them the next question. So my man, what are you waiting for? Do you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Most of the time, you know what they say next? Almost all the conversations go the exact same way. Almost all the time. The next comment out of their mouth is, I'm not really ready. Which is scary because that tells me that deep down inside, they've always known that they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. So why would they say convincingly that they are? And I don't think that it's because they really didn't think that they were. I know I'm kind of going back on what I just said. I think they know deep down inside that they're not, but they go throughout their day convincing themselves that they are so they don't have to deal with a guilty conscience. But my point is, why... If he now believes that what I'm saying is true, he believes that the Bible is the final authority, he, he, he understands Ezekiel chapter 36, that you must be filled with the Holy Spirit, he can actually backtrack in his life and go, I don't think that's ever happened to me, come to realization that it is true, and if it is true, I, 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 as of right now, I have no um, salvation. Why would he not take the offer? He knows that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He believes that God loves him. He can look back in his life and see all the times that God's been knocking at the door of his heart. He can even give you testimony after testimony of times that he should have died and didn't. He believes that God's been faithful to him. So uh, the question still stands. So why not give your life to Jesus? And the answer is because we will not have this man to reign over us. I don't want somebody reaching into my heart and changing my desires. These are my desires. You know the biggest, the biggest qualm I, I, I run into people with is about the free will. The free will, the free will, but we got free will. I, I hate my free will. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Like, let's just be real about it. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't have free will. And, you know, this could get really confusing. And, and I don't want to make it confusing. All I'm saying is, if God can reach into my heart and give me new desires, by all means, take out the ones I got or had. He's still, he, he is, and he's doing more, and I need more. There's still desires there that, God, you got to work that out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Young kids always home about the free will. I, 
Because they, they love their free will. You know why? Because they haven't seen the consequences of their free will yet. Right? Come on, somebody who's married. Can I just talk to somebody? When you said everything that you wanted to say, how did it go? How did it work out for you? Come on. And then you go, man, I wish there was something greater than me that could just shut this mouth, right? And thank God there is somebody. His name is Jesus. So we, we run from God because we want freedom from God, but then we end up slaves to sin. Jesus said that anyone who sins is a slave to sin. So now we can't enjoy our marriage because we're a slave to anger. We're a slave to sex. We can't enjoy our family because since we're a slave to anger and a slave to sex, we're always walking around with a guilty conscience. And so we can't laugh when others are laughing because we feel guilty and ashamed. And we know that deep down inside something needs to change. We just don't want to give it to Jesus because he might actually change it. And we kind of like it even though we're a slave to it. And now because we got a guilty conscience and we can't enjoy our family, it leads to an excessive lifestyle because now the conscience is going wah, 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 wah. And we got to numb the wah, wah. So we get on our video games and we just stay on the video game all night because as long as I'm on the video game, I don't hear the wah, 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 wah. Or I get on Netflix and I watch my favorite TV shows and one episode after the next episode after the next episode because as long as I'm living in somebody else's life, I don't really have to deal with my own. Ooh. Ooh. And you know what happens next? You know, you're playing video games, you're watching TV, and this is, this is creating dopamine. And so uh, your body is just pumping this dopamine. And that's why you feel better, not only because you're getting outside of your life into somebody else's, but also because it's stirring up this, this physical reaction in your body. It's like you just feel better. All these uh, the senses in your brain are going, oh, yeah, this is, this is where I need to be. But now you've watched so much TV and you played so much video games that you're strung out on dopamine. Your body is depleted and so now you start to be angry and irritated and have outbursts of wrath and you know what happens next now you got a guilty conscience and after the guilty conscience now you got to play more video games and watch more movies and come on somebody and you're a slave to sin so Paul says if then you were raised with Christ Listen, you're no longer under the condemnation of the law. The Bible says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. See, this is the freedom that we've been looking for, that we went everywhere from, but from, to God to get it. But we come to God and God says, you, you're forgiven. You're, you're, you're clean. You're mine. You belong to me. Now my word has the last say. So we come to God, he says there's no condemnation that now the guilty conscience is, is, is washed away, right? Which, by the way, needs to happen on a daily basis. <sighs> Maybe it's just me. <laughs> People think I, I read my Bible daily because, because I'm just holy. I read my Bible daily because I'm a mess. <laughs> I'm like, God, remind me, remind, remind me again, like, what'd you say? There is, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Okay, good, because I had that memorized and I just forgot it because the devil was all up in my ear t telling me, you, you know why? Because he wants me to get stuck back in that cycle again. David said, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So the devil knows that if he can pull away your joy, the joy that you have of being free in God and forgiven, then you got no strength to love and be patient with other people because you're so busy condemning yourself. Now you're irritable and upset. And now if he can get you irritable and upset, he can get you to say something and do something that you shouldn't have done out of your being irritable and upset. And now after you've said something and done something that you shouldn't have done, now he can walk around and condemn you for it. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Get you a slave to sin. You get in the word of God and God says, hey, 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 hey. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Brandon, do you believe? Yeah, Lord, I, I believe. Brandon, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. And he breaks, 
and he breaks the cycle. And so this is why Paul says, listen, you died with Christ. Your sins are forgiven. You were raised with him. Now, now seek those things which are above where Christ is, seating at the right hand of God, sitting at his right hand. That's the, that's the, the testimony of your forgiveness. I was reading a commentary. It kind of said something I never really thought about. It said some people are discouraged by the fact that they can't see Christ. The fact that you can't see Christ is because he's sitting at the right hand of God. Which means the fact that you can't see him is a testimony that where he is now positioned, his, his very presence is symbolic to the fact that it's accomplished, it's done, and he's sitting. And his sitting is a, is, is a representation of your forgiveness in the presence of God. And so as long as Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, he's testifying to God, if you will, of your forgiveness. So the fact that you can't see him is not a discouragement, but an encouragement. Oh yeah, why can't I see him? Oh, because he's at the right hand of God, representing me before the Father. This is good. I like this. Right? <laughs> Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. You were raised with Christ, free to enjoy God, love God with all of your heart. I had a, a, a friend of mine come to me the other day. He said, he said, Brandon, he said, love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul. And then go do whatever you want. I told that to my class. They were like, ooh, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I said, no, 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 think about it, think about it. If you love God with all of your heart, all of your soul and all of your strength, you can go do whatever you want. Because if you love him with all of your heart, everything that you're going to want to do is please him. Come on. <laughs> Romans 7 says, Therefore, my brethren, you, has, you have also become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. In other words, uh, the spirit has power to do what the law never could. All the law can do is point out your sin can't change your heart. In fact, it's ironic that the law was written in stone, kind of symbolic to the heart, because the law could point out your sin, but never had the power to actually change your heart. So God, by the Spirit, does something the law could never do. He reaches in to the heart, pulls out the heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh. He fills you with his Holy Spirit so that you're free to do what you love which is serve God. This is a really good quote a friend of mine, uh, Victor, shared with me from uh, Pastor John Piper. It says this, freedom, follow me, because it's kind of deep, but it's really just what I said a second ago, just said a lot harder. Freedom is doing what you love to do. If what you love to do is what you ought to do. Let's say that again. Freedom, true freedom, is doing what you love to do if what you love to do is what you ought to do. Transformation is the change of our hearts so that what we love to do is what we ought to do. Transformation is the change of our hearts so that what we love to do now becomes what we ought to do. The freest of all the people in the universe are people who do exactly what they like to do and do not suffer in hell for it. This happens with a transformation so that what we love to do is what we ought to do. And we fall out of love with the sinful things that we ought not to do, but very much love to do when we have not yet been transformed. Freedom is seeking those things which are above. Verse 3 says, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen to this verse in regards to uh, that, just kind of um, says it 
a little richer. It says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain, so he's talking about the coming of Christ when Christ returns and we are raptured, caught up in the air with Christ. It says that, uh, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. That's a reference to Christians who have died. It's, it, they're, they're, they're called sleeping because they're going to be awakened. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who were sleeping will rise. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So there's coming a time when Christ will return. And when he, when he comes, the Bible says that we will be caught up in the clouds with them, but, but we're not going to by any means pass up those that were asleep. And in fact, they're going to rise first from the graves and then we're going to be caught up in the air with them. So make, you know, take this to heart, right? In fact, Paul writes this for this very reason. He starts out by saying, hey, listen, don't sorrow like those who have no hope. You have loved ones that have died. They were believers. My friend, like you, you're going to see them again. In fact, let me just tell you how it's going to go down. It's, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be an angel. He's going to blow the trumpet. Doo -doo -doo, right? Like, you're going to be out there like just doing your thing, wherever you're at, at your job, right? Be ready. Live holy. L live holy. I mean, keep your, keep your mind set on things above because he's coming, right? And if your hope is in the fact that you're going to see him one day, then live holy. Not in, not in fear. Live, live holy because you love him. Live holy because you're free. The wife doesn't, the, the bride doesn't, rid herself of everything that is non-marriage-like. I don't know what the word is, right? Like, she doesn't mess around. She, she puts on, uh, she, she gets ready. She puts on makeup. She puts on the bride outfit because she's, she's in expectation that she's about to marry her husband. This is not a burden for her. She's not going, oh, man, I got to put on this stupid dress. <laughs> Could you imagine that? I can't believe I have to wear this makeup. This is so, this is so stupid. And I have to be with this guy for the rest of my life. Like, what in the world? Who invented this, right? Like, shouldn't say that. This is our greatest joy. Christians walk around like, oh, you know, I can't do that. You know, I'm not supposed to do that. What do you mean I can't smoke weed anymore? Does the Bible, does the Bible, does it doesn't even say that. It says he gave us all the seed-bearing fruits and stuff. <laughs> they never even quote it right, right? <laughs> I actually had that, I, I had that conversation with, uh, with one of the gentlemen while we were passing out flyers for Bless Best. And I was like, oh, okay, all right, all right. So, so the scripture says, be sober-minded. In fact, you know why the scripture says be sober-minded? so that you may set your hope fully on the grace to be revealed to you when Christ comes. Wow. There's so much grace God's going to pour out and bring you to himself. It's going to be so amazing, and you need to be sober. Why? So, so that nothing distracts you from thinking about the grace that you're going to receive when he comes, right? <laughs> amazing. So he was like, well, you could smoke, and I was like, no, it says be sober, and he was like, yeah, but it says the seed bearing. And I was like, yeah, but it also says be sober twice, right? <laughs> be sober. Your, your adversary, the devil, seeks, ro roars, uh, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking may, may devour. And I quoted him both these verses. And every time he said, you can smoke, I was like, it says be sober. And he was like, I'm just playing. I was just playing. I just want to see what you would say. <laughs> that really happened too. I'm not playing. <laughs> but these aren't burdens for us. 
Living holy is not a burden. In, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Sin becomes a burden. When we fall short of living holy, we go, dang. Come on, Lord, make me right. I want to be right. I want to have peace just knowing that I'm like doing your will. Our nature has been changed. Now, now, now living in sin is unnatural. Being in sin used to be so natural. It just felt so right. Hearing about God, we're like, ooh, that just don't even sound right. It's not for me, not now. We shall not have this man reign over us, right? Now, now our nature has been changed. This is what we want. This is what we live for. God, make me righteous. I, I, I know this dude, he was a gangster, straight gangster, straight gangster. He gave his life to Jesus. He was like, this, I, I prayed this in prison. I'm not playing this, what he said. I prayed this in prison. God, make me righteous or kill me. <laughs> I was like, ugh, that's... I'm going to use that. I'm using that. God, make me righteous to kill me. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Verse 5, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived with them. I'll just say this. If somebody tells you, well, because I'm forgiven, I can live in sin, just quote to them this verse. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. If that doesn't scare you, you shouldn't live in fear. But if you don't have enough fear to cause you to live righteous, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. In which you yourselves once walked, when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge. You notice he's speaking in past tense. These things are already done. You already did it. The moment you accepted Christ, the old man was dead. And in fact, in all reality, the moment Christ died, God already saw your sins being condemned in Christ. He already considered you dead before you had ever even accepted Christ. But you accepted Christ, you put off the old man. You put on the new man. You got filled with the Holy Spirit, and God said, you're a new creature in Christ. Behold, old things have passed away. All things have become new. That's why it's hard when you're married and, you're, and your spouse is changing, and you guys keep pointing out who you used to be, like you still are, and you even start thinking these wicked thoughts, like, she's always like this. I can't believe, and then you got to remind yourself, Brandon, you, she, no, she's not. She ain't been like that for a long time. <laughs> the devil's lying to you. She's new. You're new. The devil even comes back to you and says, you're always like this. No, you're not. That was dead the moment you accepted Christ. You, you know it is. That's just the old man trying to come back out of the grave, trying to claim you as his own. No, no, no. I remember one day I woke up with, a, with, this, with, this, uh, with this just nasty nightmare, I'll call it. And, and it, was, it was like every night for weeks I would have this, and I would wake up, and I'd be like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm having these dreams. God, please forgive me, right? And one day, like, the Lord just checked me. Like, it just came to my mind, like, Brandon, why? Why are you claiming it like, it like you own it, like this is you? God, I'm sorry that I'm, I'm so wicked. It's even coming out in my sleep, God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and it was like, I, you know, I just kind of had this visual of like, like a demonic baby, like a demonic baby being placed in your hands. Like here's the devil, and he's like, <laughs> this is yours. <laughs> and then I wake up in the morning, and I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> I'm so sorry, God. And I'm, and I'm like feeding it and I'm patting it and I'm like, and it's growing and I'm like, we belong together. This is so bad. And one day it just hit me like, this isn't mine. This used to be mine. Like, but the moment I accepted Christ, this is dead. Right?
You have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. It's a reference to the new man, that, that God created him or her, the new man. It, it, he created it. It's done. Now you're just walking it out. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That's a reference to all who are born again. God no longer sees you for what you used to be. He sees you for who he created you to be in Christ. And now you and I need to just receive it. And when the devil comes or, or your spouse comes and tries to say, you are, yes, you're always, you always, you got to remind them, be patient, be merciful, because you do the same thing, right? Blame them and they're changing, you're changing, you're new, you're new in Christ. And when the devil comes and whispers in your ear and say, you're always like this, this is, this is, God will never forgive you because you're all, no, 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 uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. No. This is it's when you start picking up scriptures and you start proclaiming them. I'm new in Christ. All things have passed away. All things become new. He's going to start. He's going to finish what he started. He's going to be faithful to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for the free gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, that there truly is no weapon formed against us that will prosper. Greater is he who lives in us than he who lives in the world. Father, I pray for those that have been hearing the voice of the enemy whisper in their ear, telling them that they're really not changed. And they're really still the same. And they have been just tossed by the waves, the lies of the enemy. God, I pray, Lord, that they would stand in the promises of Christ. They would receive it simply by faith. That you died for their sins, that you rose again, that you're sitting at the right hand of God and you're representing them before the Father. Doesn't matter. What the enemy says doesn't matter what anybody else says. God, you said that they are forgiven. God, I pray that they would stand in faith. They would reject the lies of the enemy. And they would believe and trust. Not in what they do, but what you've done. Father, I also pray for those that maybe have not yet been made new in Christ because they haven't wanted this man to reign over them. But they recognize that they're a slave to sin and they're, they're going through that vicious cycle over and over and over and there's no way out. But God, your word says there is a way. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. God, I ask that you would set them free tonight. But I ask, Lord, that they would make the confession by saying, God, please reign over my heart. Take away my evil desires and fill me with your spirit. And if that's you right where you're at, I want to just say a prayer with you right, right in your seat. So if you say, I, I want God to reign in my heart, I want you to just lift up your hand tonight. God bless you. I see your hand. I see your hand as well. I see your hand back there to my left. Again, you're inviting Jesus. I see your hand. You're inviting Jesus into your heart. Saying, you, you be my master. I don't want sin to be my master anymore. I want your word to have command over my life. You spoke to the waves and you told them to be still and they obeyed you. And I'm asking you to speak to my heart. Make it obey you. 
that's you, just raise your hand. I see your hand back there. God bless you. I see your hand as well. For those of you who lifted up your hand, I'm going to just have you pray with me, and then I'll I'll pray for uh, the rest. We'll pray collectively, but uh, just repeat after me. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. We're going to believe by faith that God's going to honor this prayer. Say this with me. Say, God, I give you permission to reign in my heart. I believe that you love me, that you sent your son to die for me, and that you promised me eternal life if I would trust in your son. Raise my heart from the dead. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me to walk in your ways. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Lastly, real quickly, if you're, you're here tonight and uh, that first portion was for you, you, you just kind of say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm, uh, the devil's been lying to me, trying to drag me back into condemnation. And, and tonight was a reminder for me that, that, uh, that I'm, I'm free in Christ, that God's word stands. And I just want to, uh, I want to, I want to re- receive that and come back to that tonight, that place of standing in God's truth. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand. We're just going to pray together. Let me, let me pray for you. God bless you. I see your hand. God bless you. God bless you. So you're a believer and, and you just, you just want God to remind you of his faithfulness. See your hand. God bless you. See your hand. See your hand as well. Father, you see the hands that are up uh, all over this room. God, we ask that uh, you would just remind them through your word, as you did tonight, that you would continually do. God, we pray as the enemy comes and tries to whisper that same lie. He's got no new tricks in his bag. He always tries the same lies. God, I pray that in that hour you give them strength. God, that they're reminded of what you've said, what you've promised, and they stand upon those promises. Father, I ask that you fill them with peace, that you fill them with joy, that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.